Hello, dear audience. My name is Karl Levin Günther. I'm the head of Invent Clinical Services, and I'm interviewing today Ms. Marta Carnielli, the head of certification IVD of TÜV Süd. Marta, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role as uh, head of certification of in vitro diagnostic medical devices, and also what uh, role you and your department are playing in the conformity assessment? Sure. Well, first of all, hello, uh, Günther. Uh, hello, everyone in the audience. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Marta Carnielli and I work for TÜVSUD. I've been working for TÜVSUD now for uh, uh, more than four years and my current role is uh, um, head of certification of IVDs. What that means, uh, um, I'm responsible for the final review and decision making on a certification of uh, in IVD, in vitro diagnostics uh, medical device at UFSUD. In practice, this means you will see my name on the certificates. Um, for those that are, for those few that are completely unfamiliar with the topic of IVDR, could you briefly uh, please explain from your point of view what the IVDR is and what the EU, the European Union, wanted to achieve with it. So, sure, let me take one step uh, back. Uh, yeah, sure. The EU has had uh, since uh, um, I would say the early 2000s uh, uh, the um, directive, a directive to regulate in vitro diagnostics. Now, that proved uh, uh, a very good text, but um, it was a directive, so it didn't ap apply directly to the legislation of the member state. It means, meant each member state had to transpose it in its own regulation. So this led to some different interpretation from one member state to the other. Next to that, uh, the technology evolved a lot since uh, the um, directive was uh, uh, first published and then entered uh, uh, into, into force. So with this new regulation, um, well, first of all, it's a regulation. So there is no longer ne the need for the, each member state to transpose it in uh, uh, its own legislation. It is a direct application to the legislation. So it is less, uh, gives less possibility for differences from one member state to the other. That's one first thing. So more homogeneous application. Uh, the second point uh, is um, uh, more flexible when it comes uh, to the classification of uh, NIVD devices with a rule-based approach rather than a list-based approach as it was under the uh, directive. And it takes into account also the um, advancement in technology. For example, nowadays we have a lot of software. Software plays uh, a key role in the IVD. You can imagine more than 20 years ago that wasn't uh, the case, so the regulation takes into account this. The other element uh, is there is a uh, desire of transparency. Transparency of what devices are available, what their performance uh, is, and uh, the regulation responds also to this desire with the implementation that is still in progress of a central uh, database. And of course, also the uh, increased uh, uh, requirement around traceability of the device that also plays a role with the implementation of the unique uh, device identification system. That's also something new. So I would say to summarize, new technology desire of having a more homogeneous uh, implementation among the 27 member states, um, transparency and uh, uh, traceability of the devices. The goal of this, um, uh, at, at the end, uh, uh, it's to ensure the devices that are on the EU marker are safe and effective, that patient health is protected. So that means uh, because we've talk, been talking from the from the point of view of the or the regulation so far of the EU, what they want to achieve. But um, 
what would that mean um like maybe on a, on a couple of detail uh, um, um examples what does that mean from the point of view of the manufacturers what are the key changes and challenges what uh, that uh, manufacturers face when they are transitioning well i would say it's no secret that the requirements have been uh, made more prescriptive and uh, more detailed in the regulation compared to the directive. I would like to take uh, the example of the intended purpose because mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would say everything starts with the device intended purpose. What do you want this device to achieve, to be capable of doing? Uh, the regulation is uh, much more detailed when it comes to the description of the element that have to be included in the intended purpose, including what is measured, uh, what's the function of the device. I mean, if it's for uh, um, diagnosis, uh, mm -hmm aid to diagnosis, this uh, kind of uh, details uh, uh, that needs to be uh, included, but you need to be able as a manufacturer to support each claim you make in the intended purpose. And that's uh, um, really, um, I would say, well explained in the, the regulation that uh, um, for example, you claim that a device uh, Let's take the example of a PSA testing, mm -hmm. and you claim it could be used for uh, screening patients and cancer monitoring. You have to be able to support both usage. And that's uh, the uh, directive was not yeah. so, I would say, prescriptive. Yeah. Uh, so whereas now, uh, and that's this is an example, but it applies, I would say, on every step of the uh, file validation uh, and approval, uh, every, um, every claim you make has to be supported by data. Um, is there any um, any shortcut and uh, any alternative route uh, to take um, for uh, for manufacturers then redoing the whole certification process when you want to transition from IVDD to IVDR? Essentially, no. You have to do <laughs> the whole certification process uh, um, from if your device requires uh, a notified body, which is uh, the vast majority, uh, you will have to go from application through to certification. So there is no shortcut, really. Um, so then uh, the next question would be um, regarding timelines of the conformity assessment. How long um, does a, a certification or a recertification process also of an in vitro diagnostic medical device take um, in your experience? And what are like typical pitfalls or misconceptions from the sides uh, from the side of uh, uh, from the point of view of the manufacturers? So uh, the European Commission has been surveying notified bodies uh, uh, to gather a, um, a view of how much in general, a, how long uh, a conformity assessment takes place. The results are publicly available on mm -hmm. the EU Commission uh, uh, website. What we've seen um, is it depends on the type of device. Um, what we have our devices like class C's and class B for professional use, which are the majority of the devices, by the way. Uh, these uh, require a quality management system certificates. Certification for this type of device is typically um, shorter. Um, depending what uh, around uh, six months to one year, um, better be conservative and say one year. For certificate, like the highest risk uh, class, like class D devices, those require a QMS and a technical documentation, sometimes called product uh, certificate. So typically for these, we see longer uh, time. Um, currently, the estimates are between 12 and 18. It can be shorter, but uh, I would recommend to um, 
be conservative and mm -hmm. apply early and uh, ensure you have all the time to complete the conformity uh, assessment. So uh, maybe I can just uh, briefly uh, explain on high level the different steps of the conformity. Mm -hmm. assessment. Yes, please go ahead. Please take in, in uh, keep in mind that uh, some of the details may be slightly different from one notified body of the other. So I will really keep it high level. But usually you will start with an application phase where you have contacted the you know, or contact the notified body, um, provide the information on the devices that you want to uh, certify their class their uh, um, codes, applicable codes, so that the notified body can uh, see, first of all, if they have uh, the personnel available, uh, um, also the, if they agree with the classification, these type of elements. After that, there are two processes that uh, uh, run in parallel. Uh, one is the audit uh, of the manufacturer quality management system. This or at least the vast majority of this needs to happen at the manufacturer premises, possibly could also happen at supplier, but let's focus on the manufacturers now. And you have what is called the technical documentation assessment. Um, so this means um, the, you will need to provide the notified body with a a file, the technical documentation file, where you describe um, all of the um, supporting data for uh, the um, approval of this device. According, uh, the, the IVDR describes quite uh, in a detailed way in Annex 2 and Annex 3 what needs to go into in the technical documentation, but I will get into that. The notified body will conduct the uh, audit, will review the uh, relevant technical documentation, will let you know if they have uh, uh, questions, if there are observations or deficiencies, you will need to respond to those uh, uh, deficiencies and once both uh, the audit and uh, the TD assessment are considered satisfactory. So all deficiency have been closed, CAPA implemented. Final, there will be a final review of all the documentation and the certificate will be issued. Generally speaking, where we find more um, observation is in the uh, review of uh, technical uh, uh, documentation. Uh, file uh, rather than uh, than uh, audit uh, could be our good old friend that intended purpose so that is not consistent, but it could also be the data within the performance evaluation, the provided data that is not sufficient to uh, validate the performance of uh, uh, of the device. Um, what we also uh, uh, see is, um, and I'm sure you you have seen uh, the proposal for uh, extension mm -hmm. of uh, um, transition to IVDR. This is still a proposal right now. Uh, we do expect it will be approved. It's a second time uh, the deadlines are extended. However, um, so. The extension is uh, under certain condition up to two and a half years, so it's quite significant. But this is not uh, extra time uh, uh, for the manufacturers to wait uh, to do the application. I would actually encourage the manufacturer to go ahead and do the application as soon as possible because this extra time is to ensure uh, notified body has sufficient time to complete the conformity assessment of all devices, therefore ensuring continuous supply of uh, all devices, classes to uh, the uh, EU patients. So don't uh, don't weigh uh, notified body also plan usually there are the workload ahead of time so make sure you leave uh, um, enough uh, enough time also uh, if you have uh, any 
doubts on how to approach on the classification of uh, your devices, the code applicable and so on. We have now the possibility to have what is called the structure dialogue. That is uh, um, something that uh, has been um, given as an option uh, in uh, uh, an MDCG guidance published uh, one and a half year ago. Um, and it's really for uh, the possibility for the notified body and the manufacturer to talk before the application takes place. In this uh, dialogue, uh, uh, we won't tell you how to do, for example, uh, the uh, validation of your device, but we can talk about the timing, uh, the coding, and so on. So it can, uh, it is an helpful uh, um, pre-application discussion that uh, that now can take place. So looking into the future from here. Um, from your perspective, what what do you foresee as as future trends and developments for the IVD industry, um, particularly in in relation to European regulations apart from IVDR? Mm. So, um, in terms of products, so new products uh, that uh, new technologies that we we see coming uh, coming through. For instance, um, well, we start seeing uh, AI devices or devices including AI that are uh, uh, coming through. As I was saying earlier on, uh, the amount of uh, uh, software that are uh, either medical devices or IVD has also uh, increased. We see companion diagnostics coming through. Now, this is still, I would say, niche, but it's um, a type of device that I would see uh, becoming more common uh, in, um, yeah, in, the, in the future. So, yeah, there is quite a bit of uh, um, change ongoing, in addition with the, uh, I would say, classical IVDs that have been uh, on the market uh, maybe since uh, the late uh, 90s. But you have a lot of uh, yeah, new technologies such software, AI, and uh, the, the companion diagnostics, I would say, Maybe it's not uh, really, really new, but it's expanding. The companion mm -hmm. uses uh, is expanding. Mm 